Um, hi, everybody. Um, I am going to give a talk, and uh, the sort of the prelude to my talk is just showing you a bunch of slides of my work, so you sort of know where I'm coming from. So I'm going to spend the first few minutes just flying through a bunch of slides. Um, so some of you may know me as an academic. I co-authored Rules of Play, the Game Design Reader, with Katie Salen. Very interested in the discipline of game design. I, I teach at the NYU Game Center. I'm a full-time faculty there. Um, we do lots of events throughout the year, including practice, uh, an annual conference on game design itself, focusing on game design as a day-in, day-out practice by game designers. Next one's in November. I make a lot of games on and off the computer. Um, this is a game I made working at RGA. I think, Tracy, you played this game, right? Suspicion. This is a game as assassin-like. You don't know who else is playing. It's designed to really mess with the, really fuck with the sort of power politics of the office where people screw their bosses over. And it did. Tracy can, can confirm. Um, I do a lot of games for conferences over the years uh, where that involves uh, basically games as a sort of social lubricant. Um, uh, on, uh, I've probably done dozens and dozens of these games. Some of them well, with my company Game Lab. More paper games. I'm interested in narrative and interactivity. This is a book, Life in the Garden. You shuffle the pages, and it makes a coherent story every time. Other games I've done, you cut out of the book, um, or, uh, uh, or you cut out of a magazine. Um, this is my first digital game in the mid-'90s, Gearheads. I co-lead co designed with Frank Lance. Um, I've, uh, I did Sissy Fight, which was a game about little girls fighting on a, a playground with Word.com. Um, and uh, for its time, very innovative. I believe it was the first real-time chat browser-based game, so highly social uh, in, in the way that you played. Um, game Lab was a company I, I co-founded and ran for about 10 years in New York City. We did a lot of so-called casual games, although that even just saying that word gives me the creeps. But um, <laughs> uh, probably our best-known title was Diner Dash, uh, which, which for better or for worse helped invent um, casual games and has, uh, has had a lot of inheritors, including today's popular Facebook games. Um, I'm a little bit interested in games and learning, although most of my work is for games for pleasure. Um, this is Game Star Mechanic, a, a game that lets you create games uh, that still exists. It survived the, the end of Game Lab. Um, I also co-founded the Institute of Play, a, a nonprofit based in New York City that's created um, schools in Chicago and New York City, actual public schools where kids go to school every day. And the whole curriculum is based on games and play as a model for learning. Um, I have worked with a filmmaker, David Kaplan, uh, a few years ago to do a film called Play. That is a narrative short that is, uh, imagines a future where the boundaries between games and reality have gotten blurred. Um, recent project, I was a lead designer on a Kinect title called Leela that looked at the intersection of play and meditation. Um, I work with a group called Local Number 12. John Sharp, who introduced me, is in it. So is Colleen Macklin. And this was a Twitter game that we did um, where you are actually betting on words that will appear in tweets about the conference that you're attending. So you are, you are, you are betting on the uh, words that are going to appear in the, in the back channel chatter uh, of the conference itself. Um, the metagame is a game here at Indiecade. We're an official selection this year, again, with local number 12. You, it lets you make uh, comparisons and discussions about games. Uh, and, uh, and there's a culture addition, too, that extends it to um, other forms of media, art, and entertainment. Armada D6, my board game that I did with John Sharp, still in prototype form, still looking for a board game publisher, um, if there's any in the audience. Um, so uh, that won the, the Game Design Award. We're very proud about that here at Indiecade this year. Uh, you can play it in the village. Um, I've, I've been working on games that take place in physical spaces for many years. This was my first attempt at that, uh, called Three Games for a Gallery. Um, another project that uh, for New York Gallery that that uh, where you are moving blocks in uh, uh, large-scale blocks on a platform. Um, of course, more recently, I've been working with Natalie Pozzi, an architect, doing uh, games. This is uh, 16 Tons, where you actually uh, um, bribe other players with real money that you take out of your pocket at the beginning of the game. So it's a simple strategy game, but with this betting, uh, betting mechanic where you don't move on your turn, but instead other people bid on your labor. So. Um, that's, uh, that's the, the interesting uh, sort of perversity of that game. The, the second game I did with Natalie, Cross My Heart and Hope to Die, featured a labyrinth made out of 30 foot high cloth uh, drapings. And that was actually um, uh, based on the myth of the Minotaur. Um, Flatlands, a game that features my 
200 plus board game collection where you are sort of choosing and selecting a board from the collection as a move in the game. Um, whoops, Starry Heavens was a project we did at the Museum of Modern Art for an event there um, uh, that where people move on a life-size grid and those balloons which look really small in the picture are actually a humongous six to, six to 20 foot uh, meteorological balloons filled with helium. Uh, the ruler in the center is commanding all the other players who have to collaborate with and against each other to overthrow the ruler. Um, and our most recent work, Interference, which also won an award at NDK this year, I'm very happy to say, uh, for interaction uh, with, with Natalie. And um, uh, this is a game that has five super thin steel walls, and the walls are basically vertical game boards where you play a game with uh, another person, and other pairs of players are playing with each other. And the trick to the game is that you actually steal a piece from someone else's game and put it in your game. So you're trying to play this simple strategy game, but other people are stealing pieces from your game, you're stealing pieces from their game, so there's a lot of frustration and also metagaming and negotiation that ends up happening as a, as a result. That, that's interference. Um, uh, and with a couple current projects I'm working on, um, digital games. This is a game called 1968 that's set in Paris during the May riots of uh, 1968. It's a narrative game. And lastly, this is a game I'm working on with the Brooklyn Game Ensemble, small group in New York City that is based, it is inspired by the, uh, the Borges story about the infinite library, the Library of Babel, and it's set inside that library. So um, uh, that's it. We can turn off the projector. Um, that's the, that, thank you, that high tech uh, turn off. Uh, thank you, Will. So that, that, that was the end of my slides. I just want to give you a sense of when I, I, wh wh who I am and, and where I'm coming from when I talk about what this lecture is about, which is um, about, about being a game designer. So, um, okay, I just wanna start with an idea. And that idea is that everything is interconnected. Now this is something that I've learned from games, at least I think. If you think about the way games are structured, like a chessboard, right? Every piece on a chessboard has some relationship to the other pieces. Now it may not be a direct relationship, it may be a relationship that could possibly exist in the future at a later state in the game. But those relationships of power, of guarding, of bluffing, of fainting, of advancing and retreating, of offense and defense, it makes this kind of network of, of tight, meaningful relationships among all of the pieces on a chessboard. And, and this is true for all kinds of games. I think something like Sissy Fight about the little girls uh, playing in the, in the school ground, you're actually you know, collaborating with and against the other players there. And all of, all of the players are connected to the other players in ways that change over time. A temporary alliance, a rivalry, uh, a friendship, uh, you know, a last minute revenge, um, uh, suicide, you know, that, all of that can happen in Sissy Fight. So in games, meaning kind of springs up, right? It's, it's, it's somehow through this set of relationships among all of the parts that games, that games acquire their meaning. Um, now, uh, and, and, I, and this is something, this idea that everything is interconnected, it's something that I see in all aspects of my life, even outside of games. I mean, I, I, for whatever reason, I, I notice things like the way people behave at, at, at crosswalks, pedestrian crosswalks, and the way that the culture of the cars interacts with the, the habits of the people, and the way the exact timing of how long a yellow lasts versus a flashing don't walk creates the situation where pedestrians might become more, more audacious or more conservative, right? Also based on the, you know, the, other, the other kinds of intersections in that city. It's a set of relationships that all interconnect to sort of bubble up. And we can, we can think about even culture in general this way, right? The way that, for example, um, ideas or musical styles influence and follow each other other, over time. Now this idea that everything is interconnected, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if it's a cause or an effect of being a game designer, right? It might be that I had a predilection to being sensitive to systems in some way, and that also is what kind of drove me and interested me in game design. Or it may be that by being a game designer, I've honed and refined my sort of sensibility and appreciation and understanding of how systems work, and so I start to notice them everywhere. Um, regardless of cause or effect, this idea that everything is interconnected is an example of what I want to talk about today. Um, something that is part of games, intrinsically part of how I see games as a, as a cultural form or a, or a design practice, but also something that's part of how I see the world and how I, I, I view myself. It's something about my practice of being a game designer. Now the idea for this talk was really, in a sense, inspired by 
um, going to uh, conferences like IndieCade and the Game Developers Conference and numerous other conferences over the years. And most of the talks at those conferences, and I'm not putting them down, I think they're, they're incredibly useful and interesting and provocative talks, are about games themselves, right? How games are put together, how we can design them, why this game is successful or interesting or, or horrible maybe, or, or you know, why this game is valuable or why this game is a total waste of time. Um, um, and those kinds of talks are great, like I've said. Um, but I wanted to see if I could shift the focus today. Um, I want to ask, instead of what makes a game a good game, instead, what does it mean to be a game designer? So the idea of this talk is that we can think of game design as a, as a craft or as a job or profession. Um, we can think of it as a way to make people happy or accomplish things in the world. Um, but we can also think about it as a kind of practice, an ongoing practice that we do to better ourselves. And I also have to give credit to John Blow, who happens to be in the audience today. Um, a, a, a few years ago, John gave a talk at the Game Developers Conference, and he mentioned this idea. Um, John, John studies Tai Chi, um, and, there was a, and I, I actually got a picture of John doing Tai Chi, but I decided not to use slides for this part of my talk. So I, I, have, I have John's picture, which maybe I'll hold for ransom. But I'll, I'll recreate it for you. So it's, it's John on a beach, sort of, you know, in, in, a, in a Tai Chi stance. Um, and John asked the question, showing this image on, on, his, on his GDC slide, can we think about game design as a kind of martial art, as something which is n less about each individual game we make and more about something that we do on an ongoing basis? Now, I also study martial arts. I think maybe it's like the, it's like the geek's way to be a jock, right? Um, <laughs> I, I, I also study martial arts, and, and so I also think about this idea of something that you do to better yourself as an ongoing practice. And it's also been an idea of mine for a while that the, the NYU conference practice is also named for this idea that the, the conference I helped create, um, the idea of game design as a practice. We can see this in a lot of places. This summer I took a, a class in parkour, um, and it, what, what struck me is that parkour practitioners see it not just as a set of techniques that they learn for jumping over walls and moving efficiently through space, but it's, a, it's almost a philosophy or a way of being that can permeate their life outside of just doing parkour or taking a class in parkour. So my question today is, can we take a similar approach to game design? Is it possible to think about game design as a, as a way or, or a mode of being? Now, to organize this potentially horribly pretentious uh, sort of foofy you know, uh, talk, um, I've organized my uh, observations into a series of principles. And um, for each of, these, each of these principles represents a way of thinking about, uh, about games and also the outside world. Um, for example, the, the, the first one is based on this idea that, that everything is interconnected. Um, and so um, the, the first principle is, is seeing the hidden connections. John Sharp, you want to put this up for me? Thank you very much. I feel so sorry for tall people. They do our bidding so well. Um, so thank you, John. No, uh, OK, number one in the center, wherever you want it. I gave you full control of the placement, so. Um, yeah, keep talking, Zimmerman. Uh, this tall person is going to give you a pounding after the talk. Um, OK, so um, do you need another piece of tape? OK, yes, just actually, John, mind you to hold it there for my entire talk. That would be right, nice. Um, or, or two arms per person, that could work. Um, so the idea of seeing the hidden connections between everything, in a sense, that's how, that's how sometimes in martial arts we say you sharpen your sword, right? That's a way, that's, that's, that's a way of refining, refining your skill and your practice at something. Um, and I actually have to, th I, I think that seeing the hidden connections among, um, uh, among the parts of a system, for me, in my mind, is, um, is probably the most important skill that a game designer can have. It's sort of the most important activity. For me, it's, it's the thing that, that I try and instill in my students, right? The idea of seeing the hidden connections between things. The same practice you can do in a game, but, but you know, that you can also do when you're seeing how traffic flows on the highway or, or how ideas might flow down, down a page. Um, I want to give a couple caveats, caveats for this talk before I, I launch into the other principles. I definitely want to say this is not a prescriptive talk, right? There's a million valid ways to be a game designer. Um, so I'm not sharing with you laws or rules that are meant to be correct or a definite way that if you follow them, you end up having a meaningful uh, experience as a game designer. I'm just sharing you know, my own thoughts and observations on my own process with you. Um, and you know, that, that kind of leads to the question, 
well, if it's just my own personal observations, is this talk really useful for anyone? And I honestly can answer that question. Might not be that useful of a talk for you. Um, but I think in a sense, I'm just trying to explore a different kind of way of thinking about game design. And part of that way of thinking about game design might be going against the idea of usefulness, right? Going against the idea that, hey, this is a talk about a game, and here's how you can apply it directly to your own game. Um, but hopefully you'll get, you'll get something out of this talk. Um, so this, the, the next principle, um, now that I've made enemies of John Sharp, no, I think he's gonna come back, right? Thank you, John. The, the, I think just the, the top three, and then I'll hopefully be, hopefully, hopefully my midget status will then no longer restrict me. The, the, the next principle is um, becoming a gardener of meaning. So if being a game designer in part is about seeing hidden connections among things, um, uh, we also want not just to observe those hidden connections, but we want, we want to see what happens when, when a game sort of starts churning, right? When those, when those interconnections start, start having a relationship with each other. And this, is, this for me is part of the magic of games, that meaning can sort of spring up out of thin air. And just to demonstrate this, um, I was gonna do an, an exercise with you guys. So this is a, an exercise called uh, the five finger game. And so I need, uh, you, when we start, you guys will turn to a group of maybe, let's say, four or five or six people sitting near each other. You can kind of turn to each other, maybe uh, along a row or, or across a couple of rows. Here's how the game works. You start by putting one hand in front of you with five fingers, right? This is your life. Once you're out of fingers, you're gone. So um, you're gonna, what you're gonna do is someone's gonna start in the group, and they're gonna point at someone with their other hand. And whoever you point at loses a finger. And uh, then it's the next person's turn. You go in turns. And if you run out of fingers, you're out of the game. You get to sit out then. That's it, you're gone, you're done. No more fingers, uh, no, more, no more gameplay for you. And the last person in the game with a finger left, or, or maybe two or three, is the winner of the game. So it's a very simple game. Um, and uh, why don't you guys just start? So turn to groups of about four. Hey, back corner, are you on your second game? You're just really, really slow. Second game? All right, second game, all right. So I, I think everyone played, uh, managed to play. That was actually pretty great. This group did a variation that I hadn't thought of, which is that when you get pointed at and lose a finger, it's then your turn to, oh, you also played it that way. I also, oh, nice, oh. <laughs> nice, no, I, I love that variation. I also saw some creative uses of the, the, the single finger uh, left. <laughs> But I, won't, I won't say who. Uh, but I, okay, here's what I, here's what I want to point out. Um, th why I did this exercise. So a moment ago, just a few minutes ago, you guys were sitting in chairs watching someone strut about on stage, make fun of John Sharp and, and give a talk. Um, but a few moments later, something happened, right? Suddenly, that you, uh, initially skeptical, I think, a lot of you, how simple this game was, there were peals of laughter rolling through the audience. There were people saying, oh, no, and, and, you know, and clapping for each other. And um, there were suddenly rivalries and, and, and enmities and revenge and you know, this kind of like miniature Shakespearean drama happening. And I hear a lot, I, yeah, OK, so maybe that was happening especially much in this group over here. Um, so um, you know, I, to me, that's something incredibly magical about games that just because I threw some words at you and, and, and gave you some guidelines for your behavior and you took them on and in some cases modified them, um, that, that meaning sort of spring, springs up out of nowhere. That something that you don't think about, you know, like your fingers being connected to somehow your, your life or livelihood, um, acquires new meaning. That, that relationships among all of the parts kind of spring up. Um, and, and I like to think about my, my role sometimes in, as a game designer in, in creating these sort of magical moments of meaning springing up out of nothing, kind of like a gardener, right? As opposed to perhaps like a sculptor or a painter, someone that starts with a blank canvas, um, I, uh, or, a, or you know, a block of stone, that uh, for a few reasons. That, that first of all, you know, what a gardener does is kind of plants a seed in something and, and watches, it, watches it grow over a long process, right? And that, that seed is never, uh, put on a blank canvas. There's always some context in which a gardener works. It might be an estate manor garden, or it just might be a box on a, on a windowsill. Um, 
And, and that context is, is a really complicated one, right? It's got biology and ecology. It's got bugs that respond to the weather in different ways. Um, and, um, and the gardener, through a slow and gradual process, sort of teases out life out of that context, right? Teases out flowers or, or vegetables or trees. And they might have an intention about what they want to do, how they want to respond to this context. Um, but on the other hand, they also have to react to what happens, right? There are things in their control and things that are slightly outside of their control, like an early frost or, or a dry season. Um, or, or being in California and having to steal the water. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So there's many, many, many factors. This, uh, uh, hello, uh, water police, this guy over here. Um, so, um, the, um, the, and the actual garden, right? The actual, the actual garden that you might take a snapshot of at any moment um, is kind of less important it, it, than, than, than the process of gardening over time, right? The, the actual garden is kind of like the remainder of a process. It's sort of the residue of everything that led up to that moment. Um, and, and, you know, again, I want to ask, can we think about games being a game designer in the same way? Um, in our process, as we sort of prototype and test and shift our design, that we, we sort of try and explore the ideas we started with, but also react to what happens, because there are things outside of our control, too, that our brilliant idea ended up being basically worthless. But there's something else in our design that maybe we can tease out uh, and, and grow and, uh, uh, like a seed. And, that, and that, that process itself is part of the practice of game design. OK. Um, I, don't know if, I, don't know if, uh, I don't know if John's going to help me one last time. Oh, he is. OK, thank you, John. Uh, my next, my next um, uh, thank you very much, John. Um, you are, uh, I am your humble servant uh, of this conference. It's kind of true, because he's one of the conference organizers. Um, the next principle is, is find your paradox. Now, um, too often, I think, when we, when we game designers talk about game design, um, we, we, we try and do science. And I think this is partly due, in fact, because we're, we're very structural analytic people. I think that game designers, um, you know, rules are kind of our stock in trade. And rules are often very analytic. Um, and um, I think that sometimes we, we suffer from, from science envy. We try and explain games, right? We try and, we try and uh, explain, this is why players do this, or, or this, is, this is why this model of game interaction works, or this is how we should define this genre, or this is the revenue model that's best in this situation. And I, I'm certainly guilty of this, too. I mean, I think rules of play is, is nothing if not like a, a, an incredibly tedious collection of definitions, one after another. Um, so. so um, uh, however, in rules of play and in a lot of my work, really, even though I, I offer a lot of definitions as tools which you might or might not use in a situation, I'm very interested in the relativity of design, right? Because design is not science. And games are not one thing, but they're many things. And so it's, it's possible to think about you know, multiple truths for a single answer to a, to a complicated question in design. Um, and we, we need to embrace this idea of, of design as a sort of practice of relativity, where it's not like science, where we're looking for the single correct answer to something. But for this, for this principle, for, for finding your paradox, I want to go even more out on a limb. And I, I, I want to say that even more than embracing multiple correct answers, we want to um, embrace questions that are, that are unsolvable. Unsolvable, unresolvable questions as part of our practice. And I'll, I'll tell you, uh, to give you an example, I'll tell you mine. The, one of the things that just continually fascinates me about games is the relationship between rules and play. And you know, it, the reason why is because it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Game rules are very peculiar as a cultural form. I mean, they're mathematical. They're sort of fixed and rigid, locked into place. They're, 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 they're almost scientific and, and rational. I mean, um, the, the, the point is that if you have a board game and you're moving on the board and you land on a space and you don't know what you're supposed to do when you, when you land on that space, you need to resolve that ambiguity, right? Uh, 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 often, uh, from a rules point of view, Games don't admit of ambiguity. We need to discuss and say, hey, what happens when we land on this space? Um, if you're playing baseball and, and you say, well, this tree is second base, and someone is sort of like touching you know, a twig on the tree and out here, and someone else tags them out, they can say, I'm touching second base. No, you're not. Second base is the trunk. No, it's not the trunk. It's the roots. It's the roots. It's the branches. Well, let's resolve this ambiguity before we move on. So there's a sense in which game rules are fixed and rigid. Everyone agrees on them in advance. They're logical. They almost sounds fascistic when you talk about game rules this way. On the other hand, what happens when we play games is, is the opposite, right? Play is the opposite of rules. While rules are fixed and rigid and logical, play is spontaneous and improvisational and creative and unexpected. And to me, this relationship between these two things is, it's a, it's a paradox, right? Because 
Play in games only happens because of the rules, but yet play somehow happens despite the rules, because those two things are so, they're so connected as two sides of a coin, but yet they're, so, uh, they're such opposites. And this, this paradox to me, it's, like a, it's a kind of like a burning fire that fuels my game design practice. I don't know if you know the story, again, by, by Borges, um, called the, about the Aleph, and it's about this guy in a, in a basement, that, that uh, part of the story, that he, he finds this sort of in, embedded in his wall, he finds an Aleph, which is this sort of like Kabbalistic theoretical point in space that connects all other points in space and time, right? So it's like you can look through this little tiny hole and you see all other things. You see this, he ends up being this, these streams of consciousness in this short story where he sees it at, at different historical periods and different people's lives and, and different places um, just through this little point. So this, for me, this paradox of, of rules and play, it's, it's my Aleph. It's like, a, it's like a little point, a little tiny conundrum, but through that conundrum, it's like it opens up into the universe, right? There's sort of a, there's sort of deep mysteries embedded in this relationship between rules and play. Um, and there are certainly other, other paradoxes that fascinate me too. Um, there's things that have to do with the uncertainty of outcome in a game, but yet the way that when you make strategic actions, they have to build on each other in a logical progression, even though you, you, have, to, you have to feel like you're building towards victory, even though the game has to be, um, the outcome has to be uncertain. Um, there's, there's lots of enigmas around narrative and interactivity that I've been fascinated with. Um, and you know, even in the last panel, I heard uh, Paolo talking about how for him, this, this idea of a utopia um, relative to independence, it's more of a kind of political paradox for him. But for me, this, I, this thing of rules and play remains my koan, uh, so to speak, to contemplate, to, to meditate on. Um, and so I want to say to you, as, as, as practicing game designers, I think one of the challenges for us is, is to find your paradox, right? Um, because in a sense, the individual games that you make are really the residue of an ongoing investigation, right? The games are like the wake of the boat as, as your design process and, and your design ideas move forward in time. And the games that you happen to make as you explore these issues and ideas and things that are interesting to you and that fascinate you and that, 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 that are like a little piece of sand in your brain that, that makes you want to itch it and, and you're never going to quite scratch it. Um, and, and the paradox that, that you can find, it's like your North Star that, that guides the direction of the boat and, and tells you where to go. Um, the next principle I want to talk about is, oh, is, um, is uh, be a ninja of listening. Um, you were uh, you're wondering if I was going to finish that one, right? Um, so the idea of being a ninja of listening, I have a friend who is a car mechanic, and he often talks about how, uh, as a car mechanic, you really need to cultivate uh, uh, an ability to listen, to listen to an engine, right? So when he's, when he's working on a car engine, the, he often just kind of turns on the car engine, and he listens to it. He listens to the sound. Um, now, uh, the interesting thing for me is that we, you know, in games it's something similar, right? There, there's literally kind of mechanisms um, under the hood of the car, right? Um, and that we, we kind of make speculations about how it's functioning. And, and, um, and um, you know, as a mechanic, we can turn the engine off or replace a part or tweak the tightness of a bolt or get a new spark plug in there. Um, and then we need to kind of, you know, turn the engine off to do that, make the change, turn the engine on, and then listen again to see how it runs, right? Um, and see if we fix the problem, or, or maybe we've created new problems. Um, and, and I think that this idea of listening, learning how to listen to the functioning of a system, um, is it, really, it's really again, a key, uh, uh, a key idea that you're going to see uh, filter through a lot of these principles. Um, Jamie Griesmeyer gave a great talk at GDC a few years ago. He's a designer, one of the lead designers for Halo. And he talked about how when he was working on the driving ergonomics for a vehicle in Halo, what he would do is he would actually not play his game for hours. He would, he would spend like an hour playing some other game that he thought where they really got the driving just right. I don't know what it was. I don't remember. Maybe it was Gran Turismo or something like that where it's a really detailed vehicle simulation. And then he would jump into his own game prototype you know, work in progress and drive it for like three or four minutes and try and get a first sense impression and then jump out again, right? And he, I actually said his producer hated this technique because it was a horrible use of his time from an efficiency point of view. That he spends an hour playing another game to play his own game for a few minutes. But the point is that then he's seeing it with fresh eyes, right? That was a technique for him to get accustomed to another game, to kind of forget about the thing he's working on, where he's, he's seeing it every spec he's writing, every variable he's tweaking. He knows it too well. 
So it's a technique for seeing it with new eyes, for listening to it in a new way, trying to see it in a fresh way. When I, I was actually trained initially as a painter, and we used to do all these tricks to try and see our paintings with fresh eyes. We used to, we used to look at them in mirrors. We used to like turn off the lights and then turn them on, turn them off again. We used to like try and look at them with our peripheral vision so that maybe we could start seeing the whole relationships because it was, it was these eyes that had put down every brush stroke, right? Every, every bit of the painting and seen it grow up over time. So part of, part of listening is just, part of being a ninja of listening is also figuring out techniques that can help you become a better, better listener. The last game that I showed you the, the, with the Brooklyn Game Ensemble based on the Library of Babel, that, that, that game is, is driving us crazy. We've been working on it part time for a more, an embarrassingly long period of time. And we're, we're, we're still kind of trying to figure out, we, we know it's fascinating, but we're still trying to tease, tease the fun out of the game. Um, and it's really a process of playing the game and listening to, to, to what's happening in the game and listening to feeling my own reactions to the game. Um, and as we learn to listen, um, you know, I want to ask, what are we refining and tuning in ourselves? Um, how does this kind of listening change us? Because on the one hand, we're the mechanic listening to the engine, but we're also the engine ourselves that we are tuning as we, as we learn to listen. Um, the part of this listening is embodied in another uh, principle, which is cultivate li your libido. And um, yeah, this is the sexy one. Um, and what I mean is that it's really important to cultivate uh, a, a sense of your own, of your own desire. Um, um, you know, I, I just saw that film very recently, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, a, a documentary about a sushi, a sushi uh, maker who's, who's nothing if not obsessed with the practice, right? Not just sushi itself, but the, the practice of, of, um, of, um, uh, of making sushi. And one of the things that he talks about is uh, that you can learn techniques as a sushi maker, but the, the thing in addition to techniques that's hard, hard to put your finger on is, is the palate, right? He talks about how there's some French chef that, that is known for the talent of his palate. Now, uh, in other words, as a, as a chef, you know, your, your, your taste sensory perception is just incredibly important as a thing that you want to cultivate and be, be sensitive to and be aware of. And for me as a game designer, I think our equivalent is our sense of desire, right? What, what frustrates us? How do we get challenged? How, when do we feel rewarded? I think the, our, the palette, the main palette for us is our sense of desire, something that's harder to pin down because it's not actually linked to any sense. And this comes from the fact that games really, in a sense, are our systems of desire, where we are, are challenging and rewarding our players. We are sculpting kind of you know, levels of, 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 of challenge and difficulty. We're figuring out about you know, how much of this pain are they going to tolerate? What, what, what are they going to find pleasurable? What are the different kinds of pleasure that I can put into this game for different kinds of players? Um, and, and so some of my techniques for cultivating my libido, my own sense of desire, is one of them is getting addicted to games. I let myself get deeply addicted to games. You know, every once in a while, uh, maybe, you know, maybe once a year, there's a game that I just let myself get obsessed with. And I think it's a little bit like, like Dr. Jekyll. You know, it's like I'm experimenting with my own chemicals on myself, right? But I, but I, I want to experience that. I want to go through that rabbit hole, right? I want to, I want to go through the, the first blush of loving a game and then the, the kind of like getting deeper and getting to know the details and then getting to the point where like playing the game is this sort of nauseating chore that I'm somehow compelled to do even though I don't want to do. Um, you know, like when you, you like you're, you're finishing the bag of Doritos and, and the big bag, you're like, oh God, just a few more, you know, and you're sick to your stomach. But somehow you're, you're sort of going through that, that bottleneck of desire. So it's important to kind of experiment on ourselves and, and, and letting, letting yourself like and, and dislike games. Um, the, 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 um, it also, I think, means getting in touch with your childhood self. I think that as children, um, uh, a lot of our, uh, a lot of our, uh, uh, the sort of deep bedrock of our desires are formed when we're children. I'm not saying that play is for children. I see, you know, play is, uh, so children and adults all in, can engage in sophisticated forms of play. But in terms of cultivating our own palate, I think getting in touch 
uh, with, our, with our childhood is important. And when it comes to actually working on a game, again, like where I am with the, with the, the, the Brooklyn Game Ensemble game about the library, it's almost as if you're, you're, you're cultivating the, the ability to have a divining rod, you know, that, with those, those fork-shaped sticks where people are looking for water. As you play your own game, can you follow that? Do you, where are you getting that little tickle of fun, right? Where, 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 are, you, where, where are you feeling that, that sense of desire and, and cultivating uh, that, that, that knowledge about your own desire? Um, the next one is maybe is obvious, but, uh, but it's also really important. And that's just be playful. Now, I mean something really specific by this. I don't just mean like be, you know, be silly. Um, um, I mean something, uh, 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 wh when I talk about play, um, you know, I, I, I mean something quite particular. Um, play means a lot of things in, in, in English. And one of the definitions for play is if you talk about like the gears of a car, um, when we have something like this, that w that's like the play in the system, right? Like the, there's a little bit of play between these gears. Or if you have a, if you have a car, um, there's play in the steering wheel, right? So here's the steering wheel. Oh, now I'm moving the tires. Oh, but here's a little bit of play. Now I'm moving the tires here. And, and why is that play there? Well, there's a system there, right? So there's a steering wheel, there's a, there's a drive shaft, and there's an axle, and, and two tires, right? Um, so let, me, let me get in my car. There's also a, a, a class in mime for everyone. Uh, so um, so what, what, why, what is this play, this play of the system, uh, this little bit of play in the steering wheel? Um, what is that? Well, that exists only because there is this system, right? This more utilitarian functional system of the wheels and the, and the axle and the drive shaft and the steering wheel. That play is only there because of those other more utilitarian systemic elements. Um, but I, I feel like I'm poking my head. There must, I must have a uh, sunroof on my car that I'm sticking my head through right now. Um, but the, the, the play also only exists sort of despite that system, right? The play is the very element of the system. Let me just step out of my car. The play is the very element of that system which exists despite that, right? It's almost there um, in opposition to the more utilitarian functioning of the system. And so um, in a sense, now I have to push my car off stage. Goodbye. OK, sorry, I get a little obsessive about my mime realities, don't I? Um, 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 you know, this is, uh, uh, all right, I, I'm not responsible for number three. I think that was uh, John that put that one up there. So quick to blame the tall people. OK, you know what, We're, we'll, um, we'll put this here. I have to say, I found very non-threatening non temporary tape, because I was so concerned about not not messing up these wonderful stage sets that they had. Now I'm paying the price. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I get for being nice, I guess. Um, wow, silence, crickets. Um, so um, let's get back to play. Um, and so play, in a sense, only exists within a structure. But it's sort of questioning that structure, right? Um, for example, uh, if I said, um, uh, hello, Mr. Paper, I'm Mr. Tape. Hello, Mr. Tape, I'm Mr. Paper, right? Well, what, why is that playful? Why is that playing? Because there are structures here, like the structures of identity, that we know that this is a piece of paper and this is a tape and they don't talk and I'm a puppeteer. But when I make a little joke like that, you know, we, we're playing with those structures and systems. And, and I love to watch children walk sometime because they'll, they'll play with structures of gravity or their own bodies or, or just, a, you know, they'll start walking and then suddenly they'll start walking backwards for a few steps and then forwards. And they're sort of teasing and playing with those systems, right? That's play. That's why, it's, that's why it looks playful sometimes when, when children walk funny. And for me, being a game designer, it, it means cultivating that sense of play, playing with boundaries and structures as a practice, right? And some of my games do that within the game, like 16 Tons tries to cause little trouble, right? Pulling out, pulling out real money and, and bribing other people in the white box of a gallery and turning this sort of modernist icon of, of, a, ga of a white gallery into a betting pit. Or something like Suspicion, the game I show that kind of upends the, the power politics of an office. Uh, through its play. Um, and so, it, so, so play can be about innovation, right? Play can be about um, finding new genres of, of, of within, within our established existing structures of what, what we know is right and proper in the game industry. We can play with those expectations of our players or those expectations of our industry as well. Um, and I, I also want to add that, 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 that you know, it's important to be playful, but, but not because that's what I'm supposed to do. Right? But in order to play, I think that play is fundamentally unnecessary. 
And that's part of its magic and its beauty. And the play is liberating to players because it's unnecessary, that they don't have to do it. And I think, similarly, it's liberating for us as designers to, to embrace the unnecessary quality of play. Um, and, um, and, and, and it can diminish play if we try and burden it too much with, say, a social message or, or something that, that's not playful, that we know in advance, that, that doesn't embody the creative and unpredictable quality of play. Um, and uh, 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 just a final word on play, um, even though I, you know, I sort of defined it and it's sort of free movement within a more rigid structure, um, we can't really define it. Play for me is also itself a paradox. It's also itself a kind of enigma. It's sort of like what Freud theorized about the unconscious, right? That if, that if once we actually understand and understand the unconscious and we bring it into the rational light of, of sort of analysis, it's not unconscious anymore. It's by definition unknowable. The unconscious is, because it's the unconscious, right, it's out of the outside of our rational understanding. And for me, play is similarly outside of our rational understanding. So I can sort of try and offer concepts that give us a handle on it. But the thing itself, I think, is always going to be elusive. And be, so being playful for me, becoming attuned to play, um, is less about theoretically understanding what it is. And it's more like when, when a musician might say I, they're learning to listen to silence. Right? They're learning to, to try and listen to something which isn't there, but yet sort of structures everything about them. Um, principle number seven is um, the, the player is your other, uh, recognizing the player as your other. And um, for me, design is an intrinsically humanizing discipline. And what I mean by that is that when we design something, we're designing for another person and we're putting ourselves in that person's place, right? We need, to, we need to be able to anticipate what it means for another human being to, to sit down with our design and to, to begin to interact with the, the controls of our game. To, as a, we need to think about our game as a space where people interact with each other. And in that sense, I think, game design is an intrinsically humanizing process. And, and we can become um, uh, you know, better people or at least more sensitive to other human beings through design. Um, and in a sense, game, games, uh, games are, um, uh, the player is kind of a mirror for ourselves. The player becomes a mirror, a way for us to know ourselves better. Um, Frank Lance, a brilliant game designer, has talked about the idea of donkey space in poker. And that's where if, if you and I are playing poker, then we're, you know, I might be bluffing, you might be bluffing, but you know that I know that you know that I might be bluffing, right? And so I know that you know that I know that I know that you know that I know that that bet you just put down might or might not be a bluff, right? And that, that kind of super complicated psychological space, that's donkey space, right? Um, and that, that, that happens in any game where you have, you have people interacting with each other. I think it happened even in the five finger game um, that you guys played. Um, and in a sense, game design is donkey space squared. Because cause, cause as game designers, we're not just in that space, we're creating the possibility of the space where donkey space happens. Um, and so, so you, really, you really have to think about how it is that, that, that you're going to be able to, to put yourself in the place of players uh, that are in your game. Um, one of the specific techniques for this is communication. That I, I always tell my students that I, I believe that design is at least 50% communication. Communicating is so important in design. Whether you're communicating to a publisher because you want to get money, whether you are communicating to other people on your development team, you're trying to, to talk to the programmer, the visual designer, about what you think might be right for an aspect of the game, or whether you're just communicating with a player directly, designing an interface, or communicating the state of the game. Um, the, the, the game I mentioned, Diner Dash, that the Game Lab made, the, the, kind of the, the hidden work of a game like that for game design is actually not what you think it might be. It's not, it's not the characters and the look and feel of the game, and it's not even the level design. The hardest thing about that game was actually communicating the state of the game with every click to the player. You're playing Diner Dash, and there's some customers at a table, and you know, it's sort of customers at different tables. You click on this table, and a whole bunch of things happen. OK, so I click on the table, and then it sets up a cue marker for the waitress to come over. When she comes over, they change their state. Maybe she's picking up their, their ticket for them. So then the ticket changes from ready to be picked up to be picked up. The customers themselves change in their emotional state from impatient to, to waiting again. Now that also results in some money or points being given to the player, which then might give you a special bonus for some more points. And it literally seven or eight things happen. That was one click, right? Seven or eight things, complicated, intertwined state changes happen with a single click. And that's communication, right? And so, so being able to understand 
how it is that someone who's not in your head, who didn't see you lay every paintbrush of the game that you're making, is going to understand the game that you're building at that moment is, is, um, is, is part of, of, of uh, recognizing the player as your other. But I think, that, I think that it goes deeper than this. The relationship with the player goes deeper um, than just anticipating them and imagining them. Of course, it's really about collaborating with your players. And this is, I think this is one of the most, most subtle and, and, and complicated things uh, about game design. And, and, and this principle number eight is, is go with the flow. Um, I want to tell you guys a little anecdote um, about Interference, the game, the game that I did with Natalie Pozzi that, that, that um, we're showing here at Inter uh, Indiecade. There was a moment, Interference premiered this summer in a, in a cultural institution in, in Paris called Gaité Lyrique, which also uh, commissioned it. And um, that we, I, I had no idea that I would still be playtesting the rules for this game uh, right up until the 11th hour. We were, we were going to begin installing it next week, and I was still very dissatisfied with the game design. And so we were in uh, uh, Berlin and uh, another city teaching a workshop, and we were playtesting every, every, every time we could gather enough people into a room to playtest. And, and as the walls are vertical, but we were playtesting on these, these large sheets of paper where we had printed out the pattern with little plastic pieces. And, um, and, and, I, and you know, that, that at those moments, I knew that we were going to have to start install. We had a hard, that's the hardest deadline, right? The deadline is not going away. Game is going up at, at a, on a certain day. Um, it is shipping. And at the same time, I was just, you know, I was nervous as fuck about, about the game design. I felt it was too complicated and elegant. And so that, that was sort of like the emotional background for all these playtesting. But then, of course, during a playtest, we actually, and it's a very chaotic game. There's lots of people starting and ending their games whenever they want. Um, we often had three tables and maybe up to a dozen or more people playing at once. And so I, I, I couldn't really be nervous. I had to actually play the game myself and enjoy it, right? I had to, I had to listen listen to the game and, and listen to my own, my own sense of desire, what I felt was fun. But more importantly, I also had to listen to the players, right? Well, I had to observe them. What are they doing? What, when, are, when are they feeling frustrated or confused? What, what are they enjoying? And also, I talked with them, of course, right? Dialoguing with them. They had ideas. They knew it was a play test. They were there to help me out. They, you know, each reaction and idea that they had, I had to, I had to sort of balance in my mind, right? What, how does this affect playability or simplicity or elegance or depth, right? Um, is this new idea that they have teach, uh, teachable to new players? Um, does, it, does it go with the thematic idea of the game? And any new rule which might fix another rule makes the game even heavier and longer to learn, right? And, it's, and, and, and in any case, you know, it, it, it's, like a, it's like a doctor listening to a whole room of patients shouting out you know, different symptoms and trying to figure out what's really going on you know, with, with the game itself. So, so it, was, it was kind of a, you know, it, it's really it was solving problems, right? Solving problems in the midst of all of this sort of emotional, intellectual uh, engagement. And it's really an amazing high. That, that feeling, that to me is sort of like that was the essence of being a game designer, right? I, 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 in a sense, I could feel the whole, this whole system in operation, the kind of the formal system, the social system. Um, but I, at the same time, I was very much in it. I wasn't just floating above it, right? Listening to my own frustrations and feelings. I was sort of aware and alert of my own my intellect and my emotions and, and my body. Um, and and um, uh, this may not be everyone's quint quint quintessential moment of being a game designer, but for me, um, that was it. And, and, um, and some of the techniques that I practice to try and go with the flow is one of them is being honest, right? Um, every time we play test a game, it's an occasion to be honest with ourselves with a truth about what is working and not, and not working in our game. And that our, like, like I said, our great idea might actually um, be, a complete, com be a complete failure. But there might be something else in our game, right? Can we let go of that great idea? Can we, can we kind of um, let go of our own ego as designers and recognize that, that collaborating with our play testers is one of the greatest, I, I think, gifts and, 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 and honors that we have as game designers, to let go of our own sense of auteurs and authors and set up the collaborative process both with our teammates and also uh, on our development team and also with our, with our players. And there's, it's, a, it's a wonderful practice for, for being humble um, uh, with ourselves uh, as part of this ongoing practice of game design. Um, the, ninth, the, 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 ninth, uh, the ninth principle is um, be a glutton for culture. Uh, you thought this might be another sexy one, right? Um, so 
um, the, the, one of the things that's amazing about game design is that there's no field of knowledge that's not relevant to game design. At least I haven't thought of one yet. I mean, you know, logic games are, are about logic and mathematics, but they're also about, um, you know, like I said, pleasure and psychology and desire. We also have to be storytellers and aestheticians, visual and audio uh, aesthetes. We have, to, we have to understand what we do as a cultural practice and think about the sort of media landscape into which our, our game is going to fit um, and, um, and how it relates to other forms of art, media, entertainment, and pop culture. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think that through, a, through, a, through the practice of game design, the ongoing practice, we gain insight into the ways that knowledge intersects across traditional boundaries of fields of knowledge and, and creative practices. And um, what I want to uh, assert or, or suggest as part of my practice is that I think as game designers, we need to find more interests that could be a counterpoint to our interest and passion for games. I think all too often, game designers are also great game fans. And believe me, I'm a game, huge game fan myself. But I also think that we need to not just make games that are by and for gamers, where our main cultural influences are other games, right? And wh whatever it is for you, whether it's becoming a film buff or, or practicing a musical instrument or, or taking up a martial art, I think that it's, it's incredibly important that we, um, uh, that, that we have cultural interests and that we, that we, that we pursue them, right? That we, that we let our, that, that's also part of cultivating your sense of desire, your interest in, in, uh, in things outside of games. Um, I think that the, you know, when you, when you often give a talk, the, the, the newbie question often is, you know, hey, how do you get the idea for your games, right? Where do you get your ideas from? My, I feel that ideas are cheap. I think what's, what's, har what's harder is the practice of being a game designer. You can have an interesting idea. If you don't have a good practice, it won't go anywhere. But a mediocre idea as a starting point can lead to somewhere amazing if you have a great practice that allows you to cultivate it, cultivate the idea like, you know, like in your garden. Um, and and uh, this is also, um, you know, the, the fact is that I, I, maybe I'm too much a child of the postmodern age, but I don't really feel like there are that many new ideas. I feel like what, as cultural practitioners, we just steal and borrow and modify and cobble together other things. I don't mean in the sense of plagiarism, but I mean in the sense that, that it's important to get influences from all kinds of, of, uh, of cultural works. Um, and, you know, this also is part of, part of, the, part of the idea of going with the flow. That the idea of, of being sensitive to and, and, and flexible in your practice is not just about within a game, but, but outside of games. Um, the, last, uh, the last principle that I want to mention in this idea of uh, the practice of being a game designer is, is pass it on. Um, and um, you know, the most important practice of being a game designer for me is making games. And uh, playing them is also really important. But I also would put up there as something which has been incredibly influential for my own thinking is, is teaching. Um, uh, Katie Salen and I started working on Rules of Play. And really, for me, that book it was the residue of a desire to really understand what am I doing as a game designer? What, what are the concepts that are embedded in this practice that I'm doing? How can we get up, set up some kind of vocabulary for us to talk to each other as designers and understand what we're doing? And for me, teaching is such an important crucial part of my practice as a game designer. Um, and you know, it, it's reflected a little bit in some of my interests, like Game Star Mechanic I mentioned, and the Quest to Learn schools, and the Institute of Play. Um, but, but it can take a lot of forms. Um, Stone LeBrand gave a great talk at GDC this past year, and it, it called Designing Games for Game Designers. It's incredibly influential in my own teaching, by the way. Um, but one of the things that he said was that, you know, if you're a game designer, he was presenting all these games, these board games he had designed that teach game design principles. And he said, you know what? You don't have to teach at a university. You don't have to teach at a school. You're at a company. Um, at a lunch break, ask some people if they want to try one of these games uh, with the non-game designers. Uh, share, share the idea of game design with them, right? This idea of passing it on. That, that, that teaching or, or, or learning with other people is a way itself of learning, right? Um, and, and that can take so many forms, um, you know, arguing and debating and, and engaging ideas, finding some way to teach. Um, that's, the, that's, that's my 10th principle. Um, so uh, I'll just end quickly on a note that if, when, I, when I look at these principles of, of being a game designer, to be honest with you, I'm pretty bad at most of these. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, th maybe this is more like an aspirational list than anything else. I, those of you that know me well, you know I'm a horrible listener. I'm a much more natural talker. I'm not a natural listener. Um, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm not someone that goes with the flow. 
I really, usually I come into a game design process with a very strong intention that, that, that is, you know, it's like pulling teeth for me to let go of and actually see what's happening in the design process. So, so this, that for me is also part of my process, right? Is recognizing some of the things that, 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 I'm, that I'm better at, that I'm really maybe in touch with, and other things that I, that I, that I want to get better at. Um, and um, I'll just, 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 to, just to finish up, uh, I want to share with you again this idea of everything being interconnected. Um, there's a quote from Peter Hanke, uh, the, the novelist, that is, there's a connection. Every moment in my life is connected with every other moment. The connection is there. One only need dream in full freedom. Thank you very much.